content warning. This is a war story, so some depictions may be unpleasant. The story contains no graphic depictions of violence or any direct violence towards animals. The only harm the dogs suffer is emotional trauma. Gather around, cousins and nephews. It is time to sing a song. Sing the chicken song. No, young fur. We sang the chicken song yesterday. Today we must choose something different. But I like chicken. We all do, buddy. We all do. Today I will sing you the song of our people. So listen closely, as the day may come when you two may need to know the words to this song. Oh, all right. It was 1965, the second summer of my time on this plane of existence, when the draft letter came. It has always been the case that one of our lineage goes when the call comes. When they ask, we answer. So, like my father before me, and his father before him, and even my great-grandfather, all hid away their childhood bones and chew toys, put on the uniform and the cap, and watched the war. So, too, did I, like the good boy I was. But that good boy that went to Vietnam never came back. First they sent me to the boot camp to learn to kill. And to kill I learned. I became the best marksman of the whole platoon. Boot camp was tough and tiring, but I learned to love it, mostly because we got to run everywhere, and we got yelled at if we didn't bark loud enough. Some boys were not cut out to be soldiers. When someone throws a grenade, you don't go running after it to bring it back like a game of fetch. Those boys were quickly sent back home. Ah, uh, after even the last of the Labradors had managed to stand in line and bark on command, we were ready to ship out. My platoon was one of the first to arrive, and at that time it felt like a vacation. Maybe it was because of the color of my fur, or maybe it was misguided ideas about our breed. They first put me as the guard dog of the base. I didn't mind. It was easy life, strolling around the compound, barking at everyone and everything. Most people were happy to see me, as my black fur meant that the compound was secure. That time the city was lively. The war stayed in the jungle for the most part. When off duty, me and some other boys often hit the town, drinking that 33 swill. And some mornings after, it was unclear if it was the formaldehyde or the hops in the beer that was making us sick. And of course, there were the bitches around town. We had started calling them chocolates, because they were small, brown, and delicious, but so, oh so deadly. But that uneasy, but still comfortable city living didn't last long. And soon I too got combat duty. We were flown by a chopper to run up some hill, and each time I thought, is this the hill I die on? I was fearless, filled with the sense of duty, and by some miracle, none of those meat grinder moments where my two-legged friends were cut down like hay were the end of me. I managed to get away with only my fellow soldiers' blood on my fur. After six months of drop delivery, combat duty, I was promoted and offered a command. I was never one to bark orders, so I refused, and that didn't go over so well with the brass. Rear echelon MFRs put me down as long-range recognition patrol and pushed me out the helicopter deep over Charlie territory. I would spend months at a time in the jungle, and it started to show. I thought I was going feral. All that time in the bush, you start to hear things. You start barking at the wrong tree. If you go crazy in the jungle, the jungle will devour you if Charlie doesn't find you first. That fateful morning, my patrol was four boys. We should have been five, but the big burly mud from Alabama, that was our heavy, was down with fever and had to stay behind. We had instructions to check out the small village to the north, northeast of the main line of the advance. Some boys have the urge to piss on every corner. But you soon learn that in war you can't mark your territory. On patrol you make damn sure not to leave a scent, not to bark at the bastard flying squirrels. It was not hard when you got the hang of it, but it was hell at first to bury your own piss like a cat. We came upon the village from the east, the forested hillside giving us a good vantage point. Our instructions were to sniff out bombs, mines, and Charlie. 
What the brass always forgets is that Charlie smells exactly the same as the peasants, and the smell of bombs, gunpowder, and death was ever present. So it wasn't an easy job. Our command was Sergeant Pepper, a shepherd from the German service dog line, a brave and obedient son of a bitch, but a little dim, and perhaps his lineage had given him too much confidence and penchant for a stick too big to carry. I would have had a pit pull with a chip on his shoulder any day over this slant-ass branch muncher. Not that he was a bad leader, not really. He took orders and tried to execute them as literally as possible, and that in the army makes you a bloody good boy. My pair in combat was a half Dutch hund of his father's side and half Irish wolfhound on his mother, with the torso of a wiener dog, but with the fur and legs of a wolfhound, an angry and bitter mutt from New England called Rex. It was a constant joke to our company that as Rex's father had managed to get things done, nothing in this war would be too hard for us if we put our mind to it. The one covering the sergeant was called Black, a mix of a pit bull and Labrador from Sioux Reservation, who talked a bit funny, having lost most of his teeth before the war. He was the only one happy to be there, as the place he came from was destitute and barren wasteland. He had not much in the way of training, never played fetch, had no one to throw the ball. The only thing he knew was that he would follow Sergeant Pepper to the end of the world as long as there were emeries to munch on. As the designated sniper of the team, I took position in a notch of a fallen tree, and through my scope I made an initial survey of the village. Nothing out of the ordinary, mostly old men and women, worn down by years of hard labor on these rice fields. We approached the village on the road, with our tongues lolling in the slight wind that was blowing from the south. <coughs> and what is happening here? Is Brother Licorice making up a crazy story again? Go away, Bean. You're interrupting. Listen, young furs. Uncle Licorice has never been to a place worse than the vet. Don't believe his lies. Does anyone want to hear the chicken song? <laughs>